Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Before we get into the game, recap, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Radio.com, iHeartRadio, Google Play, all your favorite podcasting platforms. Hit the like button, leave a comment, and turn on the notification bell so you get a notification every time we drop a podcast. And man, Jason, this was one of the toughest losses I've ever experienced in my life as a Colts fan. It was that bad. This is on the Mount Rushmore of terrible team losses. Offense, defense, special teams, officials, everything. You name it, it was bad. It was terrible in the second half of this game. Reich abandoning the run up 17 points with ball with a fourth and fifth string tackle in the game and a 39-year-old immobile quarterback against the number one defense in sacks, knockdowns, pressures, and hurries. It made no sense. You have a young running back in Jonathan Taylor who's been balling the last five or six weeks. Since that Green Bay Packers game, he's been playing on another level. He's been playing on an all-pro caliber level the last five or six weeks. The last month and a half, he's been that good for the Colts. And we just abandoned him. We have two pro bowlers in the middle of our offensive line. We're running behind him. We're pushing the Steelers up front. We're getting the push. We're running the ball. We're up 17 points. And what do you do? You abandon the run in the second half of this game. With 20 minutes left, we're up 17 points. We get the ball back, we're up 10 points. We get the ball back, we're up 3 points. And guess how many times Jonathan Taylor carried the ball in the second half? Four times. Four times he carried the ball in the second half. Frank Reich abandoned the run. The defense, you're balling out in the first half. They got soft in the second half. They got soft. They let up. They let him right back into the game. Right back into the game. After that goal line stand, I've never in my life, never one time in my life have I seen a team, a defense, make a goal line stand up by 17 points and have the team lose the momentum. We made a goal line stand and we lost momentum up three scores. We scored three points in the second half. The offense from the first half to second half, and we've seen it so many times this year, the third quarter offense sucks. Every week it sucks. The first quarter offense, the first drive offense, the scripted drive, the first 15 plays, always fantastic. Third quarter offense, always atrocious. And then today's fourth quarter offense was worse than the third quarter offense. We only scored three points in the second half. And this game was eerily similar to last week's game. And we were very critical of the Colts after beating the Texans last week. And I had so many people say, how could you be negative? We won the game. And I said, because we're not evaluating the outcome. We're evaluating the 59 minutes and 30 seconds before the goal line fumble. Before that fumble. Because if they get it in and they tie the game, let's say they go for two and they win the game right there, then are we supposed to view the other 59 minutes and 30 seconds differently? Now we could just take all the negatives instead of taking all the positives? There's positives and negatives in every game, even this game. There were positives in this game. There's positives and negatives in every game. But I had so many people tell me last week, how could you be negative? We won the game. And I said, because the Texans are not a good team. At the time, they were a 4-10 and team after we beat them. And if we play like this, and we take our foot off the gas, and we abandon the run against a good team, they're going to come all the way back, and they're going to beat us when you're blowing 14-point leads, especially when you have to go on the road. And in this game, we go on the road, we're up 17 points, and we do all those same things we did last week, minus our starting tackles. We don't have Costanza, we don't have Smith, we don't have Clark. And then Holden goes down. At one point, we were at arguably our fifth and sixth string tackles. Maybe not according to the depth chart, but according to the performance. Just using the eye test, Holden was better, a lot better today than Chaz Green. And then he goes down with the injury, and you're stuck with Chaz Green and Jamarcus Webb. And we've seen Jamarcus Webb in the past, and we know he's not very good. So we were on, in my opinion, if I were to rank everybody I've seen play tackle this year, our fifth and sixth string. And then if you want to include Quentin Nelson in there, our sixth and seventh string. Because if we had to play musical chairs and bump Nelson out there, he's probably the second or third best. He's probably the third best tackle after Costanzo and Smith. So this was the golden opportunity to be up and to pound the rock in the second half. And we had the lead. And Reich 
coached out of our strength. He coached to our weakness, which has been a huge issue we've had with Reich all year. Getting away from what's working, getting away from your sweet spot, getting away from your strength, stopping the attack on an opponent's weakness. And we saw that today. We were running the ball in the first half. We have a double-digit lead in the second half for multiple possessions, and we abandoned the run. And it just didn't make any sense. Coming into this game, all you could pray for was a lead at halftime and a comfortable enough lead to be able to milk the clock, play against the clock, opposed to playing against the Pittsburgh Steelers, milking it, and getting out with a win. And what do we do? We go against all that. We stop running the ball. We're throwing the ball. We're putting our quarterback in a position to turn the ball over, and we're letting them get pressure on us. And it was just a nightmare in the second half as we blow the 24-7 lead. We lose 28-24, and now we no longer control our own destiny heading into Week 17. Luke, I don't have a lot to say, man. I have I have not been this pissed after a game in a very, very long time. The combination of the way the Raiders shit the bed last night Dear God. and then 24-7 to in the third quarter, and for some reason we just stopped running Jonathan Taylor. I have no idea why. The game was in, you know, we had momentum. They couldn't stop us. Hines had, was running for yards. Taylor was running for yards. It was actually helping our offensive line. Our offensive line dominated them in the run game. They yep. dominated them. There were holes you could drive a freaking truck through, and we just stopped running the ball. And people were like, well, don't bring, you can't blame Reich. It's not Reich. It's Eberflus. We didn't score any points in the last 25 minutes of this damn game. Not no. a single And also, point. Jason, yes. people blaming the defense for this game, and the defense deserves blame. I shouldn't say it like that. The defense deserves blame. They deserve a ton of blame because – They gave up 21 points in the second half. They were a big part of blowing this 17-point lead. But they gave up 28 points in the game. 14 of those points came on less than 45 yards of total offense. There was a fumble recovered at the 5-yard line. And after the defense made a 4th and goal stop at the 2, there was a punt and they got the ball back and they took back over at the 39-yard line and they scored on the one play. So the defense, as much as you want to bitch and moan about the defense in this game, It has to come after the offense. And I see so many people blaming the defense, and they're blaming the defense because of the way the game went. Because chronologically, it looked like because we blew the lead, it was on the defense. But it was really on both. And when you look at the whole game, you scored three points in the second half, and you scored zero points after the first possession of the second half. And you could also say, oh, the offense played good in the first half, whatever. The defense played good in the first half. It was a tale of two halves, and we were just awful in the second half. But out of those 28 points, half of them are really on the offense. The fumble that turned into seven points is totally on the offense. I don't put any of that on the defense. And then Rock gets beat, and yeah, that's on the defense. There's no safety help over the top, and Rock just flat out got beat. And that's on the defense, of course. But they did take over a 39-yard field. So 14, half the points they allowed in this game came on less than 40 five yards of total offense for the Steelers. We stopped the run all game. My biggest issue in this game is why Reich abandoned the run. Jonathan Taylor, with a 17-point lead and ball backed up on our own two-yard line, we ran the ball four times the entire second half. And I think he had at least one or two runs on the first possession. So when we went up 17, I'm not sure if he touched the ball again. Maybe one carry, two carries? That was, I mean, it's unbelievable. And we've talked about it all year, Jason. We've talked about it time and time again all year. September, October, November, December. We're in week 16. How many times have we said it? We've said it numerous times. It's just, it's unbelievable. I have no words, Luke. I have no, I mean, the thing you want, you got 24-7 lead. You want to run clock. You want to do what you do best. And in that game, which, in that game was running the ball. Our offensive line was dominating running the ball. I mean, seriously, I don't understand it. I'm speechless. I mean, I'm trying to come up with an explanation. There is none. With a 24-7 lead, you want to you, you want to run the ball, eat clock, and keep your defense off the field. Instead, we threw the ball all the time, and, and when our defense needed the offense to pick them up, they threw it three times and, and held the ball for about 15 seconds and punted. It yep. just... I, I, I just, I'm so angry, 
at the whole guy, the whole damn coaching staff, at the team, at Ballard for not having tackles. At, at just every, the whole last 12 hours has just been a shit show for Colt fans. And I'm so sick and tired of losing to the Steelers. I cannot stand them. And Ebron. Ebron. Out, all of the, all, out of all the teams Ebron could have signed with, he had to sign with the Pittsburgh freaking Steelers. Unbelievable. I'm so but dude, he fits. I, I just, he I fits don't, it. He fits. I had people telling me last night after we uploaded the podcast that, oh, the Steelers, def- it's not the same defense. I don't think people realize quite how bad our backup tackles are. And then on top I of tried it, to tell them. And then on top to of them. it, Holden goes down and you have to bring in Jamarcus Webb. So now we have, if you think about it, we had our either fifth and sixth or fourth and sixth offensive tackles in the game because you lose. Costanzo, you lose Smith. As bad as LaRaven Clark is, he's a lot better than you know some of the guys we've been running out there, like Chaz Green. And then you have Chaz Green out there playing the whole game. And there were people really saying, oh, this Pittsburgh Steelers, all those numbers, we listed all those numbers. First yep. in sacks, yep. first in pressures, first in knockdowns, first in every statistical category. And people yep. actually said, I had multiple people actually say to me, yeah, but that's from the first 11 games. They're not the same. And I'm like, T.J. Watt's still out there. They still got playmakers. He had Bud Dupree's not play- They still have playmakers. They still have a lethal front seven. And they have five sacks in this game. They have pressure that leads to an interception. They have pressure that led to open guys not getting good passes because Rivers was And the, the fumble. Mark. And, the, and fumble. the fumble that led to an immediate touchdown. Yep. If you're up, I mean, and then all, and then the officials and people could say, "Oh, no, don't blame the Jesus refs." Christ. And listen, we're the first ones to blame Reich. We're the first ones to blame Eberflus. We're the first ones to blame the players. We're the first ones to blame Ballard. And we love Chris Ballard for not addressing the tackles. We needed one in March. We wanted one in March. We wanted a vet in March. If you couldn't bring back Joe Haig, you have to go out and sign a backup tackle. And then we wanted one in the draft. And he goes, what, eight, nine picks, and he never drafts a tackle. And he was cool with Raven Clark. He was cool with Chaz Green. That was the plan, and the plan has failed. And Ballard's had and he, and, 30 plans. If he has 30 plans, 29 of them have worked out. Most of them have and then you, passed with flying colors. But the backup tackle plan has been a total, absolute bust. And it has to be fixed, and I believe it will be fixed next year. But it's like Colt fans, oh, just because – when we had to play Chaz Green or Raven Clark against the Packers and it didn't work out, or against the Titans and it didn't work out, or against the Browns and it didn't work out. Now it's magically going to happen against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's magically going to happen at the right tackle spot when he's already worried about his blind side when we have Chaz Green blocking T.J. Watt. I don't know how people thought that that could magically work. What is it? It's like an amnesia. It's like week to week. Everybody thinks, oh, if it was an issue last week, it's just going to go away. It's just going to magically go yeah. away. And it doesn't work like that. It's a, Chaz Green's not going to get good overnight. Yeah, the amazing thing to me is the, the, I wanted him to take a tackle in the second round, or the second the second pick of the second round, and he took Jonathan Taylor. And the crazy thing is, down the stretch of games, we seemingly don't use Jonathan Taylor. It's the yep. craziest thing. Yeah, but the Taylor and like, you don't the, use them. The Taylor pick turned into a great pick, especially because Marlon Mack goes down. No, but what I'm but, but what I'm saying is you're not using them. No, you're not, you're not using them. You're not the, using them, and that's on Reich. But when I talk about the draft, like at the time we wanted one in the second round, he made the picks he made. They turned out to be great picks. Blackman in the third round turned out to be a great pick. I'm not going to comment on Eason because we don't know what he is yet because he's developing. And that's different. And if that turns into a franchise quarterback, then you love that pick. And either way, I like taking a shot there with Eason. But then after that, with the Robert Windsor pick, like there were picks where we addressed yep. spots where we, we had so much defensive tackle depth. Sheldon Day was starting in the Super Bowl last year. He was making playoff starts for the Niners, and he was playing big minutes for them, and we end up cutting him because we had so much depth at that at the one-tech spot. And you draft Robert yep. Windsor, who has been called up, and he's played this year, but there's no doubt in my mind, if Ballard took his favorite tackle in the fifth or sixth round, they would have made this roster, and they would have been better than the Raven Clark, and they would have been better than Chaz Green, and they would have been better than Jamarcus Webb. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And he just flubbed it. And he made a mistake. And that's how it's going to happen. He's a human. He's going to make mistakes. He's done way more good than bad. But we're the first to blame everybody when we think blame is necessary. When we think it's warranted, we're going to blame them. If we don't think it's warranted, we're not going to blame them. And 
To have people say you can't blame the refs, there were numerous horrible calls. Like, I thought the call against Glowinski was a very questionable call. There was no need for him to put his hands on the guy as he was falling to the ground. But if you're the ref, you should be able to swallow that flag. Because that flag or the, uh, the illegal goals. contact on uh, the legal contact on Xavier Rhodes on the opposite side of the field. Awful. That was another awful. Bad, and, awful call. And right before that, they missed a pass interference that would have been a pick six. That was a heads up play, I yep. guess you could say. Because even if they throw the flag, it still doesn't make up for what it would have been if Chase Claypool didn't push Rock. Because that was a pick six, most likely to the house. Didn't and they end up the scoring on that though? The game's over at that point. Did they, didn't they end up scoring on that drive? Yeah, they scored a touchdown After the, on that drive. The, After yeah. that, they had two more calls that drive against the Colts that were both terrible calls. There was a pass interference. And there, was, there was two pass interference. Yep. There was an illegal contact, and then there was a pass interference, both against the Colts. There was only one bad call all game against the Steelers, and they missed a hold at the 50-yard line yep. for the Colts, but that didn't turn into anything. It was an incomplete pass. Every time they missed a call the other way, it was a huge play. And then T.Y. at the end of the game, he gets bumped on yeah, the two-yard line. He got laid He got laid out on the two-yard line. The refs in this game were atrocious. And I don't understand saying, oh, don't blame the refs. Well, just because my coach made mistakes and just because my D.C. made mistakes and just because my quarterback made mistakes and just because players missed plays, just like the Steelers did because their quarterback made bad throws, they had bad calls, they had a bad series on the goal line, they had, you know, they had blunders too. They were trailing by 17 for a reason, and it wasn't because of the refs. So it's fine to me to blame the refs if the refs deserve blame. And in this game, there was plenty of blame to go around. If you created a pie chart, there was a slice. There was plenty of blame to go around for the officials. And when you play a close game like this, I don't understand the logic of not blaming the refs or viewing it as a negative thing. What, were the Colts supposed to win this game by 20 points for it to be a legit win? Because you could easily say, well, the refs cost the Colts a touchdown before the half on the call against Glowinski, which was a ticky-tack call. You could say they took a pick six off the board or at least a... They allowed something to happen that would have turned into a pick six if that didn't happen. I know that the penalty wouldn't have been equal to a pick six. It would have just been 10 yards, and maybe that's a problem with the rule book. I don't know, but that's another seven. And then you have the illegal contact on third down, which led to seven. So the refs were honestly responsible for probably 17 to 21 points <laughs> I mean, in this game. So they were that bad. Because there were so many big calls. And then T.Y. there on the two-yard line, I think we score and win the game if they throw a flag there. And he obviously got laid out. So the refs were awful. Yeah, I mean. It doesn't excuse Frank Reich, but they were awful. I mean, Luke, it's been, an, it's been a season-long thing. I mean, you go back to the Marcus Peters interception and the Ravens game that completely changed the game. I mean, it's, they've been awful all year. It's just – it's mind-boggling to me how biased – refs are in certain games, Colts games, other games, and we've gone over it. It just, I mean, the combination of the way we played and then the fact that, you know, everything that could possibly get called against us gets called against us and nothing gets called against them is just so frustrating and irritating. And and I'm just so fed up with always being on the wrong end of all of these calls. I mean, T.Y. literally got laid oh, out in yeah. the end zone. Ball was the, – before the ball even got there. I mean, hit him, the ball – I mean, it's just all year – I mean, it's just so frustrating, man. And uh, the Colts just let this get away. I mean, not, I, I'm not putting the entire loss on the refs because the Colts had a lot to do with it too and the yeah, coaching. And, I mean, it's all, it was, it's all bad. It's just all bad after the, after – after the field goal to start the third quarter on the first drive, it's all downhill. All bad. All of it. Offense, defense, yep. you know, Eberflus, Special awful. Special teams. Uh, I know, obviously, yeah, just, you know, obviously Sanchez has had some things go on that are much bigger than football, but I thought he was all – he just he just seemed like yeah, everything he was punting was short today. Yeah, it was a bad game for him, and, yeah, it was not – it just – and and then we then you go back to you know the, the I mean just the obvious stuff like we we penalties turnovers drop passes you're not going to win doing that shit nope. you're just not nope. and then you get the calls against you and it's just all it all adds up to a absolutely devastatingly heartbreaking friggin loss I I just think I thought the I thought we were absolutely 
just ridiculously outcoached in the second half. I, yep. I mean, it's on just, both sides. Uh, yeah, on both, just in every and then, Jason, way. Jason, what about Rick after the game saying we didn't have an answer? How could you, as a head coach of a team, say we didn't have an <laughs> answer when the answer is right there in front of you? I don't know if it's coach talk or what it is, but to say that is very concerning. Because very concerning. the yeah. answer is right there in front of you. Reich knows a million times more football than we will ever know in our lifetime. At least I would assume so. For him not to know the answer. These are the type of games you have to win if you want to make a run in the playoffs. You can't be blowing 17-point leads and then say you didn't know, oh, we didn't have the answer. That's not good. That's very, very bad. That would be like if you gave a fifth grade test to somebody and you put white out over the three wrong answers and you just left one answer. The answer was right there in front of you. It was to run the freaking ball. How many guys, Quentin Nelson, all these guys run the damn ball hats, run the damn ball. You're up 17 points with ball and you're throwing when you have two backup tackles in the game and not just backup tackles. You're talking about like a fourth and fifth string practice squad caliber. Chaz Green isn't an NFL player tackles in the game. No, he's bad. Yeah, and another thing I love about Reich is is the way he seemingly thinks that every player is equal. No. Like I'm looking at this quote. I'm looking at this quote after the game. Reich felt the backup tackles did fine. Now they gave up five sacks. The interception was a bad throw, but he was also being pressured. He, tur- he Rivers fumbled the ball because of pressure that he didn't help Chaz Green on because, yeah. you know, every player is the same, right, Luke? Every, uh, every player, player is, is the, the same. same. And then at the end of the I mean, game, he has Zach Pascal open. It's a bad throw. Do I blame Rivers? Yeah, you have to make a better throw. But Rivers also is getting hit, and he's under pressure. Yep. There was a Burton drop on that drive or maybe the drive before, it was a bad throw. But guess what? He was getting hit. And this is a 39-year-old quarterback, and when the pocket's clean, he's really, really good. There's a reason he wasn't good last year when he was with the Chargers, and it's because the O-line sucked. He was getting hit all game. And when you're 38, 39 years old, and you're not mobile, that's going to be an issue. The line this year for the Colts has been really good. And we allowed five sacks in this game. And it's not all in the tackles. There was pressure from up the middle, too. And, you know, there's blame to go around. I saw Glowinski get beat as well. So... There was definitely blame to go across the line. But when Costanzo and Smith are playing, it's just a different offensive line. Rivers is a different quarterback, and it's a different offense. And we've allowed 13 sacks coming into this game for Rivers, five in this game alone. And then out of those 13, I want to know how many are when Costanzo or Smith aren't in the game. Because Braden Smith has allowed zero sacks this season, and I can't imagine Costanzo having more than one or two himself. So most of these sacks have come in limited snaps from backup tackles. So Rivers now been sacked, what, 13 plus 5? He's been sacked 18 times. Out of those 18 times, I want to know how many of those were at the fault of a backup tackle. Because I would assume, and I'm just putting this number out there, it's somewhere from 9 to 10 out of those 18. And you might say, oh, that's not that bad. Well, they've played probably (laughs) one-sixth or one-seventh the amount of snaps. And they have more than half of the allowed sacks, and they play two out of the five spots. So that's pretty friggin' bad. Yep. And, uh, you know, a lot of these plays, I mean, I go back to to the Cleveland play from inside the, what, two yard line where he runs that deep pattern and leaves uh, LaRaven Clark one on one with Miles Garrett. Uh, you know, he just, uh, some of the things he does just d- d- defy logic. And he did it yeah. again today with, you know, trying to block, you know, TJ Watt with Chaz Green one on one, no help, you know, empty backfield, nobody in the back. Play I mean, action. Just, yeah, just, but just defy. Could you logic, imagine going man. play action with these tackles? And I the mean, thing is, Jason, the most frustrating thing is. Because even though we saw the outcome, I saw the outcome in a different way. I didn't see us blowing a massive lead. I saw us probably playing from behind and struggling because you figure, okay, if you take a lead, then you could pound the rock up the middle. And if you pound the rock and you're up, if you told me we had a 17 point lead coming into the game, I would assume we win the game or, you know, find a way to win the game because knowing the tackles are the biggest weakness and knowing 
that if you're like if you're Frank Wright coming into the game, isn't all you could pray for a second half where you don't need to throw and you just need to pound and pound and pound the run game? And then you have your back who's playing so well the last five, six weeks, and you give them four carries in the second half when you have multiple double digit leads, it just doesn't compute with me. It doesn't make any sense how Frank Reich, an NFL lifer who plays for a decade in the league, is a part of some really good offenses, plays in an era where running the football came first and throwing came second, and then he coaches for all these years. And obviously he's a great offensive mind because you look at Philadelphia and how much they miss him and how much Carson Wentz misses him. And you see Rivers take this huge step forward from last year to this year with Frank Reich. And he's obviously a great offensive mind. And then for him to continue to make the same mistakes over and over. And then for him to say in the post game, and it might just be coach talk, but we didn't have the answers. How didn't you have the answers? You had a back with damn near 70 yards at half and finishes with damn near 70 yards because you abandoned him in the second half of this game. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And it's so frustrating. And we kind of saw it last week too. We blew the 14-point lead and everybody said, oh, get off right, get off right. Why are you complaining? We won the game. And we said, because the Texans aren't a good team. If you do this and you coach like this and you play like this against a good team, you will lose. And there's a real possibility that the Colts missed the playoffs at 11 and 5 and the Raiders didn't help us last night and we didn't help ourselves today we certainly did not help ourselves today no we didn't and, and the thing is we had this game I mean all we had to do yep. was really lean on them and run the ball they couldn't stop the run in the first half we were wearing them out our interior of offensive line was opening up huge holes and and if we, we would have just stuck with that in the second half it would have ate time off the clock it would have put more pressure on Pittsburgh and, and we just, I mean, instead of doing that, we did the opposite. And it's just, I'm so tired of having to talk about this every week. It's, it's you know, we're doing, we're, we're doing this well, and then he just, for no freaking reason, stops doing it and plays right into the other team's hands. We piss away a lead. It's the same thing. It's Groundhog's Day, like Chuck said. It's literally Groundhog's Day. We do this all the time. It's so old i'm at the point now where i'm starting to think this is what he's going to do all the time whenever we're doing something well for no reason he's going to try to do the opposite for no apparent reason i don't i don't i mean because he's done it so many times luke he just keeps doing it and th in this game i mean it's if he doesn't see if they don't go back and watch the film of this game and, and just get sick at themselves for the way they called this second half i, I don't know what the, I, I just i don't know so I tweeted after the game, Reich abandoned the run up 17 with ball. And this guy responded to me, this tweet doesn't exist if Rivers has four touchdowns in a Colts win. Then somebody responded to him, don't need four touchdowns from Rivers if run game is rolling. And then the other guy, the initial guy, says, I agree, but you're bringing up a chicken-egg scenario. The run game point has been made, and I made a legitimate counterpoint. It's not a legitimate counterpoint. You're playing with a fourth and fifth string backup tackle, and then your sixth string backup tackle comes in the game. So that's an awful point, and obviously it didn't work, and you lost the game. How could that be a – how could anybody think that's a good counterpoint? That's an awful counterpoint. It's delusional. It's delusional just like Frank Reich saying, you know, the, the backup tackles played well. Yeah, or well, blocking, this you know, moron's not the coach of the team. That's true. I, I, and listen, it, it's dude. I think half our fan base is delusional. The way they acted, like the Steelers were were the Raiders' defense this week. Like we were just going to roll our helmet out there and, and throw for four hundred yards and run for one hundred fifty yards with you know two turds at, at at the tackle. Although I thought Holden was good, um, but Chaz of course Green he goes down. Uh, of course Holden of course. plays well, so he gets hurt. Yeah, and, and Chaz Green was a disgrace again. And, and I, at this point, I don't even blame Chaz Green. No, I mean, I blame the Colts for running his ass out there. But, I mean, you just can't do these things. And, and as far as, like, you know, just our fan base, I don't understand why they believe that we were just going to go out there with this team and be able to throw the ball. You, you, you don't understand. When you have two absolute train wrecks, I mean, not Holden, but, but Chaz Green and then Webb <laughs> at, at tackle, you, you can't throw. You cannot throw. He's not going to have time. If, the, if you're going to throw, it's got to be screens. Did we throw one screen the entire game? I think we threw one screen on third down when we were on the two-yard line, backed up. One yard. One, one screen the entire game. I mean, maybe Hilarious. more than that, but I don't know. It's 
didn't seem. Uh, like no, it. I don't think so. Like I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. They didn't. They didn't. I don't think they threw any screens, and right. except for that one. And so, I, I just I'm so fed up with like people thinking that just because you put a guy out there and he's in the NFL that he's going to be just as good as the guy that he's replacing. And it, and sad. Our I think our head coach believes that. It, I mean, because the way he coaches, mm-hmm. he coaches like you know. We've, he's got his two all pro or his two Pro Bowl caliber tackles out there when he actually has two trash cans out there, and it just it blows and, my mind. And also I thought, to this moron on Twitter, you're not playing the Steelers at this point. You're playing the clock. You're playing yep. to milk the clock. You have a 17 point lead, and 16 out of those 17 points need to make it to the end of the half. You had probably 20-something minutes left of football at that point. You need to get to double zeros on the clock with a one-point lead. That's what you need at that point. You don't need Rivers to throw for four touchdowns. You don't need to win a shootout. This is not first one to 70 wins. This is highest score after 60 minutes wins. And if it's tied, we'll play overtime. What an idiot, man. Last 25 minutes, outscored 21 to nothing. And also, I just want to point out, this team, when anybody gets hurt on defense, goes to shit. I mean, Kari Willis goes down when it was 24-7, to and they immediately give up 21 points. I mean, that, that's not good. I, that, Flus, I, I mean, I don't know what it is. I, don't, I mean, Wilson comes in the game. As soon as Wilson came in the game, I knew Roethlisberger's going to go right at him, and he did it the first play. The first play after Kari Willis got hurt, because Kari got hurt on the special team's play. The first play... The 39-yard touchdown to Johnson. I don't know what Wilson was doing. Rock got beat, of course, and everybody's roasting Rock. But I think Wilson was in, in, not in the right position either. And, I, and and he just went after 31 the rest of the game. He, wherever he was, that's where the ball's going. The, the way this team just, just, just completely gets discombobulated and just falls apart when they lose you know, players is, is just shocking to me. But it's a combination. It's a combination of terrible defense – and absolutely awful offensive play calling, and the referees being seemingly in the pockets of the Steelers. All that combined together for one giant shit sandwich today. That's all I can really say, man. Yep, and then what about the shit sandwich last night where you have the Raiders, oh, God. You have, the Raiders they're letting too. you score. Take the fucking touchdown. You coach that game. John Gruden coached that game like such a pussy last night. You take the touchdown... And then you say, I dare you to score a touchdown. Give them an extra 20 seconds. If that means scoring a touchdown, I'd much rather score the touchdown. Make them go the well, length dude, of the had... field. Make them go the length of the field. And then and well, then dude. after that, they kick it off instead of squib kicking it. So now you save them nine seconds. And then you have a completely undisciplined face mask penalty to tack on to the only play they actually had to run to get in the field goal range. It took one play, one penalty, an incomplete pass, and then they kick a game-winning field goal. It was awful. Awful defense, terrible penalty, terrible decision to kick off, and then terrible, terrible, terrible decision not to score the touchdown. Just score the friggin' touchdown. Score the touchdown. Yep. Why, why are you kicking a field goal there? That's such a pussy way, coaching not to lose. And guess what? When you coach not to lose, instead of coach to win, most of the time, you end up losing the game. And then on third down, they took a knee. They didn't even run the ball. At least run the ball on third yep. down. Okay, you want to take run wanna... around and eat, run around and eat some clock, and then to you know, you know what I mean? Like just... yeah, I mean at least if at least okay, Jacobs, you tell him to go down. That was first or second down, so you kill another forty seconds, right? Fine. But then on third down, at least run the ball up the middle and try to score a touchdown. You're so paranoid you're going to fumble the ball. And guess what? It's our fault we're in this position. We had a chance to get the Jaguars. We blew this game today. To get help from other teams would be great, but you play 16 games. If you go 16-0, and it's impossible to miss the playoffs. If you go 15-1, and it's impossible to miss the playoffs. If you go 14-2, and it's impossible to miss the playoffs. So we put ourselves in this position. We've blown games. We blew this game today. We... Lost to the one in fifteen Jacksonville Jaguars in Week One, or one in fourteen until we play them next week. Then they'll be one in fifteen, I hope. We, and we still have a chance. Yeah, we lost st- all the tiebreaker. We lost all the tiebreaker games. Too. Yep, we lose the tiebreaker to Miami. We lose the tiebreaker head to head to Baltimore. We lose the tiebreaker head to head to Cleveland, and then of course we lose the division tiebreaker to the Titans. So when you look at the playoff picture, we do still have a path, multiple paths. We need to win first and foremost. 
we need to win our game, right? If we yep. win, we could win the division with two Titans losses, a loss tonight on Sunday Night Football to the Packers, and then a loss next week to the Texans. That's pretty unlikely at this point that they lose to the Texans next week, but the Texans do seem to play better in division games than out of division games. They lost in overtime to them, and then they played two games inside the five-yard line against us. So I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. It's unlikely, but it's not impossible. If the Packers were to win tonight, that's very likely. That's very possible. And then next week – getting a inspired Texans performance against the Titans. I think that's a possibility, although an unlikely one. Then we go from hating the Steelers, and boy do I hate the Steelers, to rooting for them next week because the Browns lost to the Jets. And I think it's very possible the Browns lose next week to the Steelers because they're the Cleveland Browns. Just like weird shit happens to us when we go to Pittsburgh, weird shit happens to the Cleveland Browns. Historically, they're a dog shit organization, and they're in a position now where I could just imagine a 10-6 and six Browns team missing the playoffs for the 19th consecutive season in a year where there's seven playoff spots and 10-6 and six doesn't make it. When 10-6 and six makes it every year for the last, what, eight years, nine years. So I could just see it happening with the Browns. Browns Steelers next week. I think it's a possibility. The Steelers will be playing for seeding. Hopefully they play. The Ravens play the Bengals. I don't see, even though the Bengals have played better down the stretch, I don't see the Ravens losing that game. But it's a division game, so I guess it's a poss- all these games are division games, so I guess it's a possibility. And then probably the most likely, well, next to the Cleveland Steeler game, the next most likely would be Dolphins Bills. If the Dolphins get off to a slow start like they have been offensively, I think the Bills win that game. I hope the Bills are playing for that two seed. If they are, they probably go on to win that game, and then we would just need to beat the Jaguars to get into the playoffs. It sucks that at ten and five we don't control our own destiny, but that is the way it is right now. So the Ravens, the Browns, and the Dolphins all control their own destiny. We have the same record. We don't control our own destiny. We need one of those three to lose. If we win and one of them loses, we'll be in the playoffs. If the Titans lose tonight and next week and we win, then we win the division, which would be a topsy-turvy, crazy way to win a division after losing this game and feeling like you have just been so demoralized. This was a demoralizing loss, but I do think that we have a good chance of one of those other three things happening. It just sucks that we don't control our own destiny. Yeah, one thing I would say, the literally the one super small positive out of this loss for us, and it's really super small, but the, the Steelers and the Bills are both going to play their starters now because they're, they're basically one of them. They have to play their starters because they got to win to get the two seed, right? Yep. Because they're, t- they're tied up. So if the Bills rest their guys and they lose, then there they'll be maybe a four seed because they got beat by because they got beat by Tennessee. They gotta play their their starters. They because they could go from a two to a four if they don't win. So they're gonna have to play their starters and the Steelers are gonna have to play their starters because they're trying to get a two seed as well. So that is the little silver lining that I can give you. And the other other silver lining is Cleveland losing to the Jets, that is a huge help because now there's three opportunities. Before that, if they would have won, there would have only been two opportunities. Yep. So now we beat Jacksonville in three teams that notoriously don't play well where they're going, are going there. The Dolphins generally play bad in cold-weather Buffalo. The Browns generally play bad in Pittsburgh and never beat them there. And then the Ravens, shockingly, actually don't play very well in Cincinnati either. So one of those things – is you know I don't feel great because of this game and I'm so angry, but if we take care of business against Jacksonville, I just think one of those teams is going to lose. Now I probably shouldn't have just said that, but I really feel that way. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And if the Colts don't make the playoffs, they don't have anybody but to blame but themselves. They had this game in the bag and they blew a game against the worst team in the NFL. There's no one else to blame. So you know we go out there, we win next week. And then hope we get help. That's all you can. That's all you can do. That's all yeah. you can do. As bad as the Jets are, and the Jets have been a laughing stock all year, they have two wins now. The Jaguars have zero wins since Week 15. The Jaguars have zero wins since Week One. 
They are 0 and 14 since week one. The Jets since week one would be two and eleven, so or two and thir- two and twelve. So the Jets are actually a much better team than the Jaguars since week one. So that was an awful loss. And if you miss the yeah. playoffs and you lose to a team that bad, that's so. Somebody asked me last night actually, Jason. They asked me. If we miss the playoffs by a game, are you going to blame the Jaguar loss week one? Oh, or are you yeah. going to blame the Raiders yeah. last night? And as bad as the Raiders' loss was, you control your own destiny. Even if you don't control it next week, you control it weeks one through 17. And to lose to the Jaguars, that's our fault. The Raiders blowing it yep. last night, it would have been great for us and it would have helped us. But I'm not going to blame my season on another team not coming through for us. You have to come through for yourself. And in this game, there's another game. I'll definitely blame this game because this was a win. You should win this game oh, yeah. 99 out of 100 times, up 17 in the third yeah, we, quarter. We, yeah. yeah, we choked. That was all. I mean, I, I don't have words, man. But the only thing I'll say is this. For all you people out there that don't believe that we're cursed in Pittsburgh, I present this game to you as exhibit frigging A. Yeah. We had a 24-7 lead, everything going right. Our coach seemingly goes bananas and spends the next two quarters on Mars and seemingly lets like a toddler call the plays for the last two quarters, and and our defense can't stop a nosebleed. I mean, from going from that defense we played in the first half to that train wreck we played in the second half and the offense we had in the first half running the ball, stuffing it down their throat, to throwing it every down in the second half. I mean, it was just an absolute choke fest by the Colts, and I – I don't care what anybody says. Absolutely. We can't win. I want Pittsburgh so badly in the playoffs. I want to go there in the first round, and I want to beat them. Because if we have our tackles and we play them again, I think we beat them. And I think we could beat them bad. We were so clearly, it was so obvious that we were the better team today. We could have been up by 30 at halftime. We are clearly the better team, and I don't think they could beat us twice in a row. If we were to go there in a week or two, I don't think they could beat us. So I want them. I want them bad. And I just, I don't know, I think I think we could beat them. I think we should beat them as long as Wright could get out of his own way. It's like he coaches to lose the game. It's weird. It's like, it's like he has a bet on the other team. You know, Luke, I, I, I'm going to tell you this right now. At this point, I'm ready to see what uh, Nick Sirianni can do next year. Not this year. You can't do it now. But I, I really think they need to consider giving Sirianni a chance to call plays because this this is just I, – I can't watch this. Like, yeah. we get ahead we, – we have, we have really had about – I don't know how many games I would say we should have blown teams out, but we should have blown out the Texans. And we really should have blown out the Steelers. Yep. We, I mean, it, that's three games where we should have – and they were all – we could very easily have lost all three of those games. Yep. So it's just, I mean, at this point, it is what it is, man. I mean, I never thought that we would go into Pittsburgh, have a 24-7 lead in the third quarter, and just piss it away. And that's, I mean, it, it just, that's exactly what we did. And it, it's its frustrating. I just remembered another really, really, really bad penalty. The one on Kenny Moore where the ball got tipped. Oh, my God. Led to Jeez. a touchdown drive. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yep. All of our penalties kill us. They're all killers, every one of them. And they all lead to touchdowns. I mean, literally all of our – all the bad calls on us lead to touchdowns. It never frigging fails. Yep. All right, I think we've done enough. We didn't really talk too much yeah. about the game, but there's – I don't, yeah, I don't I mean, think anybody wants to talk about this game. I don't think anybody wants to hear it. I think they just wanted to hear us complain, go over the, the big – key points go over the coaching blunders go over the tackles and i think we covered at least all that so that's my man jason spears i'm your host luke diamond not much more to say about this one and we will be back on friday with our colts jaguars week 17 game preview it's another must win game as we call them all must win games this one really is a must win game because if you lose there's no way to make the playoffs so you have to win this game and then you have to root for one out of those other four or five things to happen and then the Colts will be in the postseason so it's going to be a big week it's going to be a stressful week and we will see there's going to be a lot of scoreboard watching split screen four box screen multiple TV set up streaming on the laptop streaming on the tablet next week as we root for multiple things to happen. But the beauty is we only need one of them to happen. So we don't need to hit a big parlay where, okay, we need all this to happen. We need one to happen, and then we need to win. 
and I'm pretty sure we're going to win next week. So we just need one of those other things to happen, and we will go over the game preview on Friday right here on the Full the Coach Podcast.